Okay. Um, one of the things that I've noticed here, and I'm you know, already going to decades of EAUs, is that the interest in bladder cancer is really increasing a lot. If you look at 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, there was much less interest in bladder cancer and several new things. One of the things is, of course, bladder cancer monitoring has boosted the interest in bladder cancer. Uh, I've seen a few sessions on trimodelta therapy. I've seen several sessions on immunotherapy. So fortunately, the interest in bladder cancer is, uh, is improving a lot and I really like that. One of the reasons I like that is I think we have to realize that bladder cancer really is an expensive disease. Um, and it is actually, per patient, one of the most expensive diseases that we uh, treat anyway, not only we as a urologist, but uh, that are treated in medical practice anyway. And if I look at my department, and of course, you know, we do a lot of bladder cancer. You see those data here, also my department, 17.1% of the financial flow is in bladder cancer. And that's of the whole budget. So we also do, we do everything, children, uh, BPH, stones, whatever. Um, also prostate cancer, I don't want to mention that, but we do that. Uh, but we spend a lot on bladder cancer, so it's an expensive disease. And here you see a recent study where we looked at them within Europe, and you see that the healthcare costs of bladder cancer within Europe are huge. That's around 5% of total healthcare costs. And what you can also see here, that's not only what we spend from a medical point of view, but you have also the costs of patients. They have productivity loss, they have to uh, stop working when they go to the hospital or when they are admitted, and also informal care, family traveling together with the patient, or family taking care of shopping, or taking care of children or grandchildren. So in all, I think bladder cancer is really a significant problem for healthcare budgets. The data, of course, within Europe differ a lot, and you can pick up your own country. We are in Spain here, we have some speakers from Italy. I'm from the Netherlands, we are very expensive, not as expensive as France, uh, but here you see a lot of countries and see how much of the money of the budget is spent on bladder cancer, and then all that is a lot. And you see that there is a lot of money spent on outpatient care. That's one of the things that we are gonna talk about today. And my old frustration, and it's getting less, um, maybe because I'm getting older, but uh, a lot of research money is still uh, spent on the big four, lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer. If you look at the amounts of money spent in the US, and of course these data are a little bit older, but still you see those are hundreds of millions, prostate, around 300 million, and bladder cancer, 21, 23, that's it. Whereas, for example, survival of prostate cancer is much, much, much better than survival of bladder cancer. So this really needs some attention. We've got a dream team today here, um, so I hope that they can help me solve the problem with bladder cancer. And this is the workshop we have. I do a small introduction, then I'll talk about markers in general in bladder cancer. Seth Lerner will talk about, you know, the actual diagnostic problems we have in bladder cancer. My old friend Pierre Francesco Braschi will talk about one of the things that he's been doing in his center like Carolina Delia also, they are using all this test in their own practice. Uh, Roberto Miano, uh, Alberto Breda is not here yet, I guess. Uh, he was very busy with live surgery, I heard. And then hopefully around 7.30, I will end up this meeting with some summary and some questions to you. The scene, biomarker issues. I've been doing biomarker studies for a long time and I will go on with that in my introduction. Uh, but basically, if you look at the AU guideline, because of all kinds of limitations, biomarkers are not recommended for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer in the AU guideline. I think that will change in the coming years because many studies are coming out. But currently, again, because of a lot of issues, and I will talk about that a little bit later, they are not recommended in the AU guideline. My thoughts, practical issues, cost issues, you know, if a test costs money, you have a problem with inter, with using that. And that differs, of course, per country and per continent and per healthcare system. Do you have a point of care test or is it a very difficult lab test? You know, if you want to have a test and follow up, you don't want the patient to come to the hospital to do that test and then go back home. And then you have to call him that he has to come back for a cystoscopy. So the practical aspects. And 
Will a urologist, for example, refrain from a cystoscopy in a new patient suspected to have bladder cancer, even if the test is negative? I don't think so. As a urologist, I would also do a cystos always do a cystoscopy. On the other hand, if I know my patient and the test has a high negative predictive value, maybe that's a test I can use in clinical practice to prevent all those cystoscopies that we do. We do hundreds, well, or close to a thousand a year in my, my department. And then patient issues, what would they expect? Well, we'll talk about that. Uh, if there are no more questions now, uh, I hope you will enjoy the workshop. And I will go on with my first presentation and I will focus a little bit more on tests that I have been using for bladder cancer.